Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guest. In this case, Jackson Lears, a professor of history at Rutgers University, a very well-known historian. And he has written an article in the current issue of Harper's Magazine, uh, which is really quite sobering. It's called Behind the Veil of Indifference uh, by Jackson Lears, Professor Jackson Lears. And I'll sort of just read the lead a couple of sentences here, uh, which is the thesis of this article. The war in Ukraine has resurrected the ultimate technocratic fantasy, a winnable nuclear war. Intellectuals at the Hoover Institution are urging American strategists to think nuclear again, reestablishing the idea that nuclear weapons are tools to assert U.S. primacy, uh, primacy over Russia and China. Now, I wrote a book once called With Enough Shovels about the Reagan administration when we had this fantasy of nuclear war fighting. Uh, and I think that the keynote here, though, is not so much that people are saying, let's go for it. They just seem to be, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Professor Elias, ignoring uh, the risk, the very high risk now and uh, the danger, what nuclear war means. There is almost a giddiness to the current involvement. This is the first time we've been, you know, we basically are backing Ukraine as the major force, the U.S., uh, against the still very powerful nuclear armed uh, nation, the uh, Russia Federation, that inherited these weapons from the old Soviet Union. So why don't, instead of my telling you what you wrote, why don't you tell me the point of this article? Well, the point of the article was to re revisit my own experience as a, a signal officer uh, with a top secret clearance on a nuclear armed uh, Navy ship, a cruiser, uh, in 1969-70, uh, uh, so more than 50 years ago. Uh, but the point uh, I wanted to make in that revisiting was to show how, how both how little has changed and how much has changed uh, in our uh, nuclear, nuclear strategy and nuclear uh, posture. Uh, in the uh, in the 1960s, uh, we were toe-to-toe, -toe, eyeball to eyeball with uh, the Soviet Union over Berlin and certainly in the, uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and we came very close to uh, blowing up the world in collaboration with, uh, with Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, but uh, we did not. And uh, Jack Kennedy, after steering us, uh, I think, uh, mistakenly and uh, uh, deliberately toward nuclear war by publicly confronting Khrushchev, uh, in the end, backed down and actually learned something from the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and he demonstrated that he learned it in his uh, American University speech. Uh, where he called not only for a nuclear test ban treaty, but for a, a growing rapprochement with the, with the Soviet Union. Uh, and that took a while for, uh, for that to happen, but it did uh, gradually happen uh, in the 1980s. And we reached a point, again, uh, under Ronald Reagan, of all people, and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, where the U.S. and the Soviet Union recognized that for all of their hostility and rivalry toward one another, they did have a common interest, and that common interest was avoiding nuclear war. So through diplomacy, they sought uh, to promote that avoidance of nuclear war and to make it less and less possible. They didn't reach uh, the goal of nuclear abolition that Reagan had hoped for, but uh, it was partly because of his own attachment to the Strategic Defense Initiative, the so-called uh, Star Wars boondoggle. But we did uh, begin a lot of uh, bilateral reductions in, uh, in our nuclear arsenals, and we did uh, move closer toward nuclear disarmament than we've ever been before. And uh, they, uh, uh, the leaders, uh, 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 at the time, uh, can uh, Reagan and Gorbachev can take 
uh, credit for that. And, uh, and yet, uh, I think there was a certain naivete that set in uh, after the uh, Cold War ended and the Soviet Union split up, uh, that nuclear weapons were no longer an issue, even though uh, we still had these huge stockpiles in both countries. And now nuclear weapons have reappeared in the public square. They are uh, a subject uh, of conversation in, at places like the Hoover Institution and other think tanks. And they are, in fact, being uh, considered seriously uh, as, a, uh, uh, as an option in the, uh, in the Ukraine war. And uh, this is, uh, in, in a sense, a return to the worst kind of confrontations uh, of the early 1960s. But there's a big difference because even Kennedy and even Reagan, cold warriors that they were, were eager uh, to create common ground ultimately between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And that uh, common ground no longer exists between the U.S. and, and Russia, and there is no uh, interest in diplomacy at all. What I wanted to do in going back to my own uh, Navy experience uh, was to revisit uh, the worldview uh, and the big picture strategy that went with uh, the possession of nuclear uh, weapons on a, on a uh, heavily armed ship, uh, the, the, uh, the mentality uh, that the presence of those weapons encouraged, uh, and to show how that hasn't, hasn't really changed at the level of strategic discussion, but what has changed uh, is the loss of diplomacy. So I was a I was this in this in this position uh, uh, on the the, uh, the USS Chicago, which was the name of my ship, a guided missile cruiser. Um, I was in a position where I was being uh, asked, in fact, ordered to uh, decrypt the message that would have launched. The, uh, the ship's nuclear weapons, which were tactical nuclear weapons. Um, what year was that? Though? This was 1969 and 1970. Um, so uh, the Chicago was either out in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, monitoring uh, Russian-made North Vietnamese MiGs uh, or uh, in the Pacific Missile Range off the coast of California uh, basically sparring with, with uh, uh, Russian spy ships that were disguised as fishing trawlers. Uh, and what I wanted to recall from that time was not just uh, the technocratic fantasy of winning a nuclear war, which was uh, very much in the minds of nuclear strategists at the time, but also in the minds of uh, local commanders whose careerism was so strong that they were willing to treat nuclear weapons as if they were weapons like any other, uh, and they wanted to use them if they could, and they often had the autonomy and authority uh, to do that. Uh, but, the, but the mentality that, that accompanied uh, the use of nuclear weapons or even the possibility of, of using nuclear weapons uh, was a kind of uh, algorithmic rationality. This is what uh, nuclear strategists came up with, and they haven't come up with anything better since then, by the way, which allowed them uh, in the 1960s uh, to imagine uh, a step-by-step -step escalation that could somehow be brought right to the brink and then uh, end it, uh, and we could break off either side. It was like a game of chicken, uh, as, as Bertrand Russell uh, put it. Uh, at one time. And the whole notion of algorithmic rationality was that you hand it over to these rules-based uh, procedures and we have uh, uh, eliminated this possibility with the use of the algorithm uh, of using, uh, of, of somehow falling prey to human error. Uh, so there was, uh, I'm a, uh, I, I'm, I found that uh, well, but point now, of, that kind of rationality showed up on on the ship and among my shipmates as well. And I call it rationality only in the narrowest sense is that it gave the appearance of rationality, but there's nothing reasonable about it. 
And what I found my, myself uh, doing was, uh, in in order to join what was called the the, uh, the sealed authenticator system, the team uh, that would join together to decrypt uh, the message launching the missiles, uh, I had to have an interview with the chaplain to see, as my uh, department head told me, without irony, if I had any particular axe to grind for or against nuclear war. And uh, I decided that, in fact, I did have an axe to grind, but I, dis but I discovered in that formulation that what, what they were looking for was the ultimate neutral technocrat, somebody who was just doing his job. Uh, he didn't uh, want to blow, blow up the world to save us from communism necessarily, uh, but he, he wasn't opposed to that possibility either. He was just doing a job and following procedures. So we had this combination of neutral technocrats, and there were plenty of those uh, on board my ship, uh, and wacko local uh, commanders. Uh, and that, pop, uh, that combination still exists uh, in our military and in our uh, think tank world of nuclear strategy. Um, but one of the other things I discovered in the in the Navy was uh, the uh, the chilling effect of secrecy uh, on on democratic uh, debate, really, and on democracy generally. Because I was told uh, that I had to remove uh, uh, any reference uh, to the sh nuclear weapons that the ship carried uh, when I had decided uh, that. I had to get out of this uh, situation, uh, and I discovered that I could apply for a conscientious objector status uh, if I could show that my attitudes toward uh, war had changed uh, since I had gone on active duty. And I could do that in the sense that I was opposed to the Vietnam War when I, when I joined the Navy, uh, but I came to realize that uh, conditions of modern war are such, and certainly my job was such, uh, that it required uh, killing civilians, uh, usually en masse, and so, certainly that's what would happen uh, in a nuclear war. So I did apply for conscientious objector status, and I did mention the fact that I was on a nuclear armed ship in that application, and I was told, you have to remove that reference uh, because the Navy doesn't admit that we carry nuclear weapons. And probably 75% of the people of San Diego, where the ship was stationed, don't know that we carry nukes. So here I was uh, basically being instructed uh, to tell lies for the, de for the Defense Department, uh, even in the process of applying for conscientious objector uh, status. Uh, so that made it pretty clear to me that the real source uh, of lies and of disinformation uh, is not whacked out conspiracy theorists on the margins of public discourse. It's uh, the military and the national security state uh, and their stenographers in the mass media. Uh, that's where the disinformation is coming from. That's where the big lies are coming from. And secrecy is a mortal enemy of democracy is another lesson uh, I brought out of this uh, experience. Ultimately, I did get an honorable discharge with a conscientious objector status. Uh, and it taught me, I think, uh, really the, what is the nature of the modern way of war. Uh, and the, the modern way of war is distance. It's button pushing. It's gone even farther in that direction, of course, with the use of, of drones. Uh, but certainly in my case, it was a, uh, there was a, a, a system in place that denatured uh, the actual human and moral meanings uh, of what we were doing. Uh, it denatured the targets. It made the targets in, uh, into numbers rather than actual uh, human beings. And uh, all of this was a way that uh, people came to terms with the uh, with the jobs they were being asked to do, which were potentially uh, catastrophic for themselves and for their enemies, uh, for their friends, for the whole human race. And, uh, and yet somehow people are able to, uh, I discovered uh, through techno jargon, 
uh, and general uh, distancing devices, psychologically distancing devices, uh, to remove themselves from the actuality uh, of what they were doing, from the real meaning of nuclear war. And it seems to me that's that's what's happening now. Although, uh, as you say, it's it's uh, it's even beyond what it was uh, uh, in the early '60s because there was some recognition then, and it continued on through the 80s and uh, into the 90s, uh, that nuclear war was uh, truly unthinkable and had to be avoided. We seem to have lost that conviction and that insight now, which is fundamental to our uh, survival as a species, it seems to me. Well, that's why I uh, suggest there is a giddiness now. I mean, first of all, if, if Donald Trump were still president and this were happening now, there, I assume, would be a significant peace movement. There would be members of Congress, particularly Democrats, speaking out. There's a deafening silence now. Uh, you're a major historian, credentialed and so forth, an a autodidact historian, Gore Vidal, uh, self-taught but brilliant, once wrote a book about the United States of amnesia, uh, we have no re- much, uh, we're not guided by history. And there's almost an unawareness. Uh, we've gone into a stage now where we we and uh, the Russians have torn up uh, virtually every arms control agreement. Uh, there's a, a, a view that somehow we can't talk to Putin about this danger, even though we managed to talk uh, with Khrushchev and with Mao and uh Brezhnev and so forth, somehow, uh, the, I, I, the very idea that maybe, uh, you know, with here now, Russia has deployed uh, nuclear weapons to Belarus. Uh, they are talking about if you are pushing them to the end, uh, which we all, we've never even given up first strike, uh, U.S. posture. Right. Uh, and uh, so, and we have continued modernizing our weapons. And in fact, there's some literature now where people are arguing, oh, their stuff doesn't even work and who knows whether it would work and so forth. But we've gone from a situation where a Richard Nixon could negotiate with a Khrushchev or with a Mao uh, to, to have, and we can't talk to Putin. And in fact, I mean, if you even suggest that there may be a Russian side or a Russian concern about NATO expansion, uh, you will be uh, taken off the Internet. We actually have a new story now. A judge in Louisiana said, no, you can't put all these people from the FBI and and National Security Agency into Google and Facebook and uh, you know, be involved basically in censorship, you know, uh, you know, or we'll go after you. So we don't even have a debate about it. We don't have a peace movement. And that's why I say giddy. There's, there, there's, and yet, uh, I, th- I think anyone logically looks at the situation when we're talking about uh, humiliating the Russian, we're talking about teaching them a stern lesson. We have to have right. their defeat. Uh, right. Well, that's not was the base was not the basis of Nixon going to China or negotiating uh, with the Russians. It was wait a minute, we have to come an understanding, even with people we think are absolute monsters, and and the irony in, in this situation is that uh, we assume we could negotiate with these communists who we once described as bent on world conquest, but we can't st- negotiate with someone who defeated the communists in an election and he defeated the, what remained of the communist party, and he's a, a avowedly anti-communist Vladimir Putin. So it's, it's, it's a, I I like you as a historian to talk about this moment. And and on one aspect, you mentioned that you were stationed in the Gulf of Tonkin. And we now know, we only learned really 20 years after the event when documents, that there never was a second Gulf of Tonkin attack, which was the justification uh, for bombing North Vietnam, and which also risked uh, a nuclear intervention uh, from the Russians, that it was a lie. So secrecy could cover the lie. And we, you know, as a historian, are you confident that we really know what happened uh, in U.S. relations with Russia and the Ukraine and who did what with the uh, color revolutions and the change of power in, in 2014 and so forth and so on? So we're still operating in an area of secrecy where we're told 
uh, you know, that if you even dare suggest there's some complexity to this issue or that the other side might have a point of view or there's something even worth negotiating about, you're now considered uh, unpatriotic. That's right. It's, it's absolutely, it's, it's stunning the extent to which things have changed uh, since my intellectual and political coming of age in the, in the 60s and 70s. You know, we reached a point which, by comparison to the present, in the early and mid-1970s, was a moment of crystalline clarity about the perverse and destructive power of the intelligence agencies, FBI and CIA and NSA and all the rest. Uh, and this was partly because of Cy Hirsch's uh, reporting in the New York Times, of all places, uh, about the abuses of power by the CIA and the FBI uh, directed against the anti-war movement, against other domestic political uh, dissenters, uh, the Black Panthers, among others, uh, breaking their charters in various ways. And uh, this led, as you know, I'm sure, to the, uh, uh, to the church committee investigations in the Senate and the revelations of uh, more uh, malpractice by the CIA and the FBI. Uh, but something happened uh, since then, and beginning in the late 1970s, uh, when the Times and other newspapers began to swerve back away and to say, well, the people's right to know has to be balanced against the government's need to keep secrets. And that point of view continued and intensified in the 80s and 90s, first under uh, under Reagan, and then after the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, um, under the uh, uh, auspices of this, this new uh, worldview uh, of a unipolar, that we had reached a unipolar moment. And the unipolar moment was, of course, the end of the bipolar Cold War and the moment when the U.S. could assert itself as the world's only superpower. And this is what Madeleine Albright and the Clinton administration uh, set about doing uh, initially by their interventions in the uh, in the Balkans uh, and uh, the events of 9/11 and after only reinforced that uh, that vision of once again the U.S. having this moral uh, role to play in the world the injection of of uh, moral purity and the need to maintain it and spread it uh, and and to promote democracy as it was called through regime change, all of this, uh, which was a very right wing and very neoconservative uh, point of view held by a, a handful of true believers initially uh, that spread and spread and became uh, partly through the influence of the Clintons and the Democratic Party uh, and uh, the, the neoliberal neocons, you might say, uh, it, it became conventional wisdom uh, that uh, suddenly regime change, which is uh, just on the face of it, a violation of international law became official government policy, and that's that's remained the case. It was you you know certainly used to justify the invasion of Iraq uh, in two thousand and three, as uh, which of course was uh, I think legitimized in a lot of people's minds by their great fear of uh, terrorism, uh, and and that uh, the government shamelessly played on that and. Uh, generated disinformation uh, through the CIA and through the media's uh, parroting of that uh, CIA disinformation. So but, but you just uttered something that is now heresy to suggest that that misinformation could come from the CIA or the U.S. government. Yes. Is now heresy. I, I can tell you, I, I published an article by Chris Hedges, who for 20 years worked for the New York Times and other leading newspapers. He was a bureau chief in the Mideast, uh, Arabic speaker, knowledgeable, uh, and so forth, a, a graduate of Harvard Divinity School, so he doesn't have his clerical uh, background and uh, a collar. And I published an article on, uh, on my website uh, where he, the opening sentence uh, was they lied to us about Iraq, they lied to us about Afghanistan, and they're lying to us now about the Ukraine. Yes. Because of that, 
when I try to purchase an advertisement within our own system of the internet that I have hosted by and everything, it was rejected. Yes. You can't suggest that because if it if it comes from an individual reporter like Cy Hirsch or Chris Hedges, no matter their credentials or their background. I mean, in my own case, I did work for the Los Angeles Times for 29 years. I, I uh, uh, you know, have a background. But nonetheless, by definition, uh, misinformation is only information that is inconvenient, to use Al Gore's phrase, inconvenient. Uh, to the American narrative and, and hegemony. Absolutely. I, I, I think that, that, well, I had this experience a few years ago when um, before the invasion of Ukraine, so it was still possible to talk about the dangers of Russophobia. And I was uh, I, making the same point that you, you've just made, is that the, you know, the chief source of disinformation, and in fact, the agency that was created uh, in order to manufacture disinformation, the CIA uh, is still doing that and is still the chief source of uh, bad information, malinformation, misinformation, disinformation, whatever label you want to put on it. It's not a bunch of wackos in QAnon, uh, and uh, it, it's it's not a bunch of Trumpists, and you know they they get a lot of things wrong, and I'm not defending them in any way, but. The, the really dangerous and powerful sources of disinformation are in the national security state, and they are protected uh, by law, by secrecy, and even more so in recent times uh, by this project of legitimation that began uh, back in 2016, 2017, which goes by the name of Russiagate, which was the attempt um, among journalists, of course, because they like these tags, uh, Russiagate was a, as the attempt to show collusion that, that uh, between the Trump administration and and uh, and Putin's government, uh, attempt, the attempt to show that Putin had somehow intervened in American elections and uh, <clears throat> and that the Russians were busily at work uh, uh, undermining our democracy, as the phrase had it at the time, and you know millions of dollars, as you know, was spent uh, to investigate this charge. And uh, Robert Mueller basically came up empty-handed, as far as the Russians were concerned. And uh, and yet, that point of view, that belief in Ru Russian interference in American democracy, will not go away. It it created an image, and this is part of the explanation, I think, uh, for the question you were raising earlier: Why the difference between the Soviet Union and Putin's Russia? Why is Putin's Russia so evil? so much more evil even than the Soviet Union that we can't even talk to these people about things that we both need to talk about for the common good. Uh, well, part of the reason is that he was demonized systematically by the mainstream press, Putin was, uh, beginning in 2016, and he was associated with Trump. And as, as we know, uh, for the Democratic Party, to be associated with Trump is all you need to be uh, condemned outright, to be uh, untouchable, really, morally untouchable. Uh, I was ha holding a, 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 a campus uh, event. I had sponsored a campus event, which included a New York Times reporter, by the way. Uh, and it, it, the point was to explore, you know, this, this resurgence of Russophobia. Why was it so intense, even without any evidence? Uh, and why was the disinformation uh, so effective? And my argument was that it was really coming from the top down. It was coming from the disinformation was coming from the national security state. We have uh, former directors of the CIA uh, uh, who have perjured themselves before Congress now posing as professional wise men and professional truth tellers on MSNBC and CNN. They have jobs. They have gigs. Uh, and and uh, this is where we are now. So when I'm, I'm, I made this argument to a bunch of graduate students, mainly, uh, some of whom were in Russian studies, some of whom were in various other foreign policy history and so on. One of them said, but we don't have to worry about that kind of disinformation anymore because we have computers. We have the Internet. And the new kind of information is just coming through social media, just wackos on social media. 
and so there's this ab this absolute refusal to recognize that there's any kind of top down production of disinformation going on anymore. When in fact, I think the disinformation is stronger than ever. We have a whole narrative uh, about the rise of the Ukraine war, uh, which leaves out uh, everything you mentioned in passing and the you know the ten years or more, eight to ten years of run up uh, to the uh, Russian invasion of February twenty. Uh, 2022, uh, and that run-up uh, consisted of, uh, first of all, the the uh, uh, the 2014 coup that overthrew uh, Yanukovych, uh, who was a corrupt uh, ruler but had been legally elected, uh, and he was overthrown in this Maidan uh, color revolution, uh, or what you know, what was purported to be the fulfillment of the color revolution of 10 years before. Uh, and this was, of course, the moment when when uh, Victoria Newland was caught uh, in a phone conversation talking about uh, regime change and how we were going to get the, you know, the, the right guy in there to represent U.S. interests. Uh, and, and what in fact happened as a consequence of that coup was that ultra-nationalists, formerly known as neo-Nazis in the Ukraine, uh, acquired a disproportionate influence in that government uh, and proceeded to press for the suppression uh, of Russian uh, speakers and Russian cultural autonomy in the Donbass. And uh, as a consequence, they provoked a rebellion there uh, and a conflict. Uh, they ended up, uh, over the next several years, uh, killing thousands of people. This is one reason uh, that Putin... Uh, decided he had to intervene. The other reason is that the U.S. was expanding NATO eastward and refusing to negotiate or even listen to Putin's pleas uh, for a new European security structure that included Russia. Uh, that was not, in other words, a, a recapitulation of NATO, uh, which has truly outlived its usefulness. Was you know it was meant to be a defensive alliance against the Soviet Union and a, an imaginary attack against Western Europe, when in fact, uh, what's, what's happened is uh, it's become an offensive alliance. It's become an excuse to put nuclear weapons on the borders uh, of, of Russia and, uh, uh, and to build up uh, U.S. bases in Kosovo and elsewhere, uh, Poland, certainly, uh, in a way that one make one, it makes one wonder what what would the U.S. do if if uh, if China were to go uh, to the you know to, to make these kind of moves in Mexico, for example, uh, right up close to the Rio Grande, building uh, missile bases and military bases uh, that are that are aimed and designed to contain uh, a supposed aggression by uh, the United States toward Mexico. Well, I think we have a pretty good idea of what would happen. The U.S. would not tolerate it for an instant. Uh, why should Putin uh, tolerate the same kind of uh, aggressive moves uh, in Eastern Europe against him? Uh, I think he's, uh, he's not a monster. Uh, he may not be a, a nice man. I'm not endorsing him uh, as, a, as a human being, but I'm think, I am saying he is... Uh, the leader of a great rival power who deserves to be negotiated with. And as you say, to say that now, to even advocate negotiation uh, and a ceasefire to bring an end to this escalating struggle, which is getting more and more dangerous, as we know, getting closer and closer to the possibility uh, of some kind of use of nuclear weapons, uh, provoked, unprovoked, it can be made up excuses. It can be actual events. All kinds of things can happen uh, or would be said to happen that would justify uh, the use of nuclear weapons. And the U.S. and Russia both have nuclear posture statements that allow that. But the U.S.'s posture statement is even more permissive than the Russians. It says basically, you know, we can go to we can use nuclear weapons first use. We can use them initially. We can start a nuclear war. Uh, if one of our allies' vital interests is threatened. That's all that has to happen. So if Poland, for example, were attacked or some other, or Latvia, you know, some other NATO country, uh, 
came under Russian attack, uh, that we right there we'd have an excuse in accordance with our nuclear policy uh, to to go to the first use of nuclear weapons. So this is truly insane. And what's even more insane is the public uh, atmosphere, or at least what we can discern through the mass media. I'm not saying that all Americans are idiot warmongers. I think most of them are, are simply uninformed, partly because of the secrecy, because of the disinformation, uh, because nobody knows the alternative narrative about the, uh, the Ukraine war and how it actually was provoked by, by the U.S. and by the uh, and by the Kiev regime as well. Uh, nobody knows that narrative. They think Putin woke up one morning and said, "By God, I'm going to invade Ukraine," and that's it. Everything begins on February 24th, 2022. Well, as you point out, there's a there's an eight year uh, run up to that, really longer if you go back to the uh, to the color revolutions of, of 2004. So it's, it's very hard to, uh, to be in this position of uh, trying to get the actual circumstances across, trying to uh, educate uh, people when they're, when they're uh, completely uninformed and misinformed about what's actually happening. Yeah, but the reason they're misinformed, now come on, let's, let's really talk about our class what I call the courtier class yes. uh, of well-paid professors and journalists and so forth. Uh, I mean, you, there's a story right now, because what, there was one illusion. We, with the internet, we had sort of the wild west of freedom and you right. could publish anything on which I thought was the best of all worlds. And it was described as the worst of all worlds. And nonetheless, it doesn't exist anymore. We know, as a matter of fact, there's a, actually a 55 page court uh, statement from a federal court. Yes, he's a Trump appointee. Uh, nonetheless, uh, documenting uh, with names, uh, the people from uh, the Biden administration, but certainly uh, Trump was doing this as well, but with enthusiasm in the Biden administration, putting FBI agents, NSA people, all people from this national security state uh, to advise uh, Facebook, Google, uh, all of these organizations, much more extensive than what the church committee revealed uh, right. decades right. ago. And it is in the actually news story in the New York Times. It's not, this is potentially a threat to the First Amendment, which is what the judge said, after all. No, this is a, a, a threat to making the internet safer. Uh, this is, and this is the same thing, right. uh, you know, right. in, in their business section this morning. Uh, not a hint that right. maybe this is dangerous to free speech. Right. And uh, I suspect if this had come up, been revealed as being done by the Trump administration, there'd be at least some civil libertarians complaining. They even quote professors who are supposed to be experts on the press and on freedom saying, well, it really didn't cross the line because they didn't come in with the power to stop them. You have an FBI person in your newsroom telling you, wait a minute, do you want that paragraph? At the same time, the government is saying, we may crack down on Google, we may break up Facebook, we may get rid of Section 230 of the old, you know, uh, obscenity code that's given you the freedom to do this. Uh, and you're representing that government, and you're in the newsroom, you're in at, at these agencies. Uh, I, I suspect this is pretty much what happens in China. Uh, I know this will be heresy to say it, I suspect they don't go in there with, they don't have to go in with right. guns drawn. They got members of the Communist Party sitting there, right? And saying, wait a minute, this story is unbalanced. Uh, you might want to think twice about that. Right. And they're listened to. Right. Uh, you know, that's the modern form of totalitarianism. And the irony is right now, I'm talking to you as a, you are a, a highly regarded, distinguished professor. I'm not blowing smoke here, you, you know, uh, as was Chris Hedges, a highly regarded, distinguished journalist, winner of Pulitzer Prize and other prizes and so forth, Cy Hirsch as well. And these people are made non-persons overnight. 
So there's actually, without my being paranoid, a real possibility that this podcast that I've been doing now, uh, I think for six years or something, I mean, I've done it for a long, maybe five years or 50 or now, whatever it is, no, six, uh, could be dropped by NPR. Uh, right. right. It would. That, right. It just would take a phone call somewhere. Wait a minute. Do you realize on that show we had a, a Ukraine, the necessity of our Ukraine involvement denier? Right. <laughs> Not quite as bad as a vaccine denier, but, you know, a, a, a denier or somebody who had a, said Putin uh, may not be the most dangerous, irrational person that ever has lived. Uh, that's heresy now. Right. Absolute actionable heresy. If you were not a, a, a tenured professor, I don't happen to be, uh, there will be people calling for your dismissal, maybe even with tenure. Uh, you're not allowed to say that even at respected universities. Uh, what you just said on this show. Uh, what now? What what used to be called legitimate dissent is now dismissed as Kremlin talking points. Well, but it's espionage. Kremlin. It's and, a violation of the espionage. That's right. Act. That's right. And and uh, so we shall we shall see. I mean the the uh, the, the you you've raised so many so many fundamental points. And I I didn't read the uh, the Times story, but I read the Washington Post account of the same. Uh, legal decision that you were referring to that that basically confirms the work that Matt Taibbi and other investigative reporters have done uh, th through uh, what he calls the Twitter files to demonstrate the the kind of deep entanglement of of the national security state in in s systematically censoring uh, public discourse where it is most. Uh, vital and vibrant today on on social media. I mean, the national security state and the surveillance agencies have always been have always done that. The FBI used to do it. They their job has always unofficially been to monitor uh, and control the boundaries of permissible dissent and to keep the debate narrow and to keep you know. In, 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 in to, to keep peace advocates, for example, during the Cold War, uh, to tar them with the brush of of, uh, of communism, they were sympathetic to the communists. If you were act, if you call, were calling for peace between the superpowers in 1950 or 1951, uh, you could be easily accused of being a communist. We have returned to that uh, that mentality. And, oh, no, and no, 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 uh, no. Let me interrupt you. We have communists we love. And then we've got the ones we need to hate. Now, for example, uh, China, we love right, sure. when, when Nixon made peace, as long as, and right up through much of the pandemic, as long as they supplied us through all these goods that Amazon delivered, everything, every computer, sure, every sure. phone, they were wonderful. It's when they challenged American hegemony and said, look, we'd like to get into the high end. We'd like to make more sophisticated equipment. We're not just going to exploit young Chinese women to assemble iPhones. We want to get right. to the, you know, you have a company like Apple that's being celebrated now, a three trillion dollar company with you know income greater than France and India combined, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody points out that Apple rose to this great capitalist success, unprecedented, on the backs right. of right. exploited Chinese right. workers, exploited Absolutely. by a communist Absolutely. system that delivered a docile labor force that couldn't form unions, couldn't object. Um, some people tried to commit suicide out of these buildings, never examined. Human rights was never discussed in terms of the rights of a Chinese worker working in a yeah. Foxconn or Apple plant, you know, or the, their right to strike, their right to have opinion, their right to deny their labor. No, we loved, come and right, the irony, exactly at this moment, we want Chinese, the people making products in China to move over to Vietnam. Vietnam is still this communist country that we went to war with. And, you know, four, five, six million people, nobody's clear about the figure, died in that war, including uh, almost 59,000 Americans. But, you know, we uh, that's the communism we like. And the sure. fact is, the fact of the matter is, and you hardly ever hear any reference to where Putin came from. Yes, Putin had been, you know, in the Soviet security system, as most people were involved with the old system. But Putin right. was part of the uh, of what used to be the Leningrad and the St. Petersburg right. group. He was a reformer with subject. He's the guy picked by our guy, Yeltsin. 
the guy we had against Gorbachev, right? And uh, freedom loving. And he was there because he was the only sober person when Yeltsin, was, I was covering this at the time for the LA Times. Uh, Yeltsin was this hopeless drunk. Putin had the virtue of being sober and he was fiercely anti-communist and he defeated the communists, the remnants of the communist party in the election. So it never was about communism. It's always was well, about I, U.S. Yeah. hegemony and power. Sure. It was never about human rights. And this, I get back you're, to, you're, 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 yeah. you're, put, you're putting your finger on the right thing here and, and U.S. hegemony and power, because what we're looking at now in this Biden administration and this awful moment that we're in and this flailing over, at, at, you know, this pouring of billions into this, uh, at, I, I was going to say pointless Ukraine struggle, but it's not. It's it's worse than that. It's it's potentially calamitous. Quite quite easily could become calamitous for all of us. But uh, but there's no debate. There's not even a, a murmur of dissent uh, within Congress or within the mass media. And there's very little within the universities. Uh, the 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 uh, the educated class, the people the people who used to call themselves intellectuals uh, or public intellectuals. There's been a major failure uh, to confront what was actually going on here, it seems to me, which is the, the flailings of an empire in decline. You know, we have a situation where we constantly hear talk about global leadership from the likes of Biden at all. Genuine global leadership would involve a leader coming up uh, and, and saying to the world, look, we're going we're gonna to step back from this nuclear brink. Uh, we're going to be begin dismantling the doomsday machine. Uh, we'll keep enough of, a, of, of an arsenal to serve as a deterrent, but we are going to make the first move. We're going to step away from this nuclear arms race. And part of the reason we're going to do that is we want a new era of international cooperation because we have to. We have to have international cooperation to confront the climate crisis, for example, the environmental crisis, which is so often mistakenly separated from the threat posed by nuclear war, when in fact, of course, there's nothing more poisonous for the environment than, than a nuclear exchange. We don't even have to talk about nuclear winter, although that's the ultimate expression of uh, environmental collapse under, under a nuclear exchange. Um, but the point is yeah. we need international cooperation. We don't need to be going around picking fights with everybody in the world. Every, every rival leader we can imagine, we can turn into an enemy, an adversary, uh, and there's almost a yearning for that kind of, uh, at least among the, uh, uh, the, the strategy making classes, the intellectual classes, the chattering classes. There's a yearning for what they call moral clarity and for an evil. Demon. That's why the demonization of Putin was so important. And I think China, the Chinese, of course, can be demonized as well and, and probably will be. There will be a bipartisan demonization effort there, too. So we can forget about the kind of international cooperation we absolutely have to have at this cultural and historical moment. Uh, as long as we're doing this, this uh, idiotic uh, adolescent posturing, you know, it's like the schoolyard bully challenging everybody around him to fight and put up their dukes uh, because we're going to, we're going to win for democracy here. We're going to, we're going our, get ourselves some regime change going. I'm, I'm just appalled by, by the, uh, the sophomoric uh, banality and also the huge danger uh, that these people are are playing with, and by people I mean the you know the Fab Four of, of uh, uh, Biden, Biden, Sullivan, Blinken, and Newland, uh, and uh, Bi Biden probably the least uh, functional of the four, but uh, but the others can run him uh, can run him around any way they want. So I think this is a. We, for an empire to face up to its own decline is a very hard thing, and not many have done it very successfully or gracefully, but that is really what we have to do here. You know, we're going to wrap this up, but I think we're, uh, we haven't talked at all about your great work in understanding our history, your professional career, and so forth, and uh, I do want to draw on that a bit because... Um, what really seems to be at stake is this hubris, uh, this American exceptionalism, and it's it's toxic. 
I, 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 you know, and I've been in totalitarian countries. I've covered the old Soviet. I was in China during the Cultural Revolution. I've seen, you know, I know tyranny. It scares me, totalitarianism mm-hmm. and its totality and its control. But nonetheless, whether it was Nasser's Egypt that I was in, whatever I've been, I've been I, Cuba, whatever, uh, at least most people or many people knew the game was rigged. You know, it was like no one ever thought Pravda is telling you the truth. They're telling mm-hmm. you the Communist Party position. Right. You might want to read Pravda to see the Communist Party position. But right. even members of the party, when I interviewed, they really didn't believe they would get, you know, uh, a balanced view. They didn't get it from this fiesta. That was the government position. The same thing in China. I know we have a lot of uh, Chinese students do dissertations and so forth where I teach. And, and, you could see they in social networking and in, in the media in China. There's a lot of suspicion about how does medicine work and where is the role of corruption and what doctors were drunk and you know. I mean, there's questioning, you know. Uh, and and I'm not saying that. I mean, I like the idea of limited government. I I, I believe in the, our amendments. I believe in that. But but the the corrosive thing in America is we think that whatever we do is by definition democratic, enlightening. I mean, mean, it's startling. Uh, So, you know, we didn't do torture. We did enhance interrogation. We still have Guantanamo. We never had a single trial about the people we accused of of doing all this and and what was it all about. And we're, you know, we never really had any examination of who were the 15 Saudis and what was their relation to us? You know, right. uh, just as we're not having any examination of who blew up these pipeline going to Germany that was right. the, the right. oil. There's, there's right. no questioning of it. Uh, yeah. And and so this, it, it seems to me. I'm asking you as a historian. Just take a few minutes here if you have the time. But but it seems to to me this notion of American innocence uh, the, the, that by definition. We, we even have headlines now. The democracies are rallying. Well, the democracy includes Hungary, the, includes Turkey, but, you know, all, they're all the democracies. And as if no other state has to worry about delivering to its people, as if the Chinese leadership can be totally indifferent to the flooding they're having now or breathing in Beijing or, you know, the issues that go into global warming, as if all they have to do is push a button and silent. No, people don't stay silent, certainly not in the modern world of communication and so forth. And and so it seems to me the, the real, the cancer here is, is this uh, arrogance, this American exceptionalism that we teach from the earliest days in school. Uh, and and this, it's, first of all, a lie, because after all, we were founded on slavery and only rich white males could vote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We destroyed it. I don't have to go through the whole history, uh, but we don't even learn from our own experiences. That's the U.S. of amnesia. And and uh, we, we just assume uh, that we tell the truth, that there is no such thing as American hegemony. That's simply uh, uh, the, the effectiveness of our wonderful eco- economic system. Uh, it's startling. So as a historian, we have a, if you t- j- just tell me, what did you learn studying history and our place in that history now? Well, I, I, I and you think can bring up some specific books you think we should read or articles you read or what have you, in addition to the Harper's. Yeah. Well, I just came out with a new book called Animal Spirits, The American Pursuit of Vitality from Camp Meeting to Wall Street. So uh, I have to plug that at the moment, which I think okay, is... Okay, who's the publisher? Uh, uh, FSG, uh, Farrar, Strauss, and, and Giroux. Uh, and uh, before that, I... Uh, so I'm 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 concerned about the uh, you know what what the economist Keynes referred to as animal spirits, which is a spontaneous urge to act. You know the kind of uh, by kind of in uh, individual and ultimately collective uh, vitality. How people get worked up about something. One of the things uh, they get worked up about about. Uh, uh, you know, asset prices in the you know in a bull, in a bull market, uh, and and, uh, and Keynes was very interested in in the role of, of uh, that kind of excitement in in capitalism, kind of emotional history of capitalism. But there's also an emotional history of war and empire, uh, which of course is collect- connected co- strongly to uh, to capitalism in structural and economic ways. 
Um, but there, but there is uh, a, a kind of uh, yearning uh, for uh, hero, heroic action, for relief from the uh, the boredom and routine of a prosper, even a prosperous commercial society. You know, is looking for ways uh, to redeem itself uh, and and to somehow pursue transcendent goals. Uh, whether it's going abroad in search of, of monsters to destroy, uh, or or just staying home and and uh, paying someone else to go after those monsters, as as we're uh, mostly doing in Ukraine, though not entirely. Um, but the but the point about this uh, this and, you know, war has has always had this exciting dimension, and uh, and it has you, you after nine eleven there were people. Uh, like George Packer writing in the New York Times magazine saying, uh, well, this, you know, this is great. I feel great. I like the feeling of being at war. He actually said these things um, because it generates heroism. It generates self-sacrifice. And he went on and on. Uh, it, was, it was such a familiar uh, argument to me because I'd encountered it so many times in my own cultural history of the, of the imperial U.S. And the, what I, what I like to point to is I think is really important in American public consciousness is uh, this, the, the role of evangelical Protestantism. And I don't mean to pick out evangelical Protestants for particular abuse here, because I think it's a very secularized uh, version of evangelical Protestantism that ends up governing our foreign policy and influencing our public debate. But the, the part of it that I think is, is, is critically important and that has survived is the notion of a righteous community. That is, if you are, uh, if you are saved uh, in the evangelical tradition, the Protestant tradition, then you are part. You become part of this righteous community. There is no purgatory. There is no middle way. So you're either inside or outside. You're saved or damned. And that's when you know patrolling the boundaries of the righteous community becomes important. And agencies like the CIA and the FBI become important too. Uh, but I think that uh, um, we are looking constantly at the formation of a righteous community, the attempt to sustain it and defend it uh, and to attack those who are outside it and who seem somehow to, uh, to threaten it. Uh, and the involvement in maintaining that righteous community uh, creates a feeling of virtue. It creates a feeling of hubris, a sense that we can do anything. We can do anything. We're the greatest country on earth. And all of that came, was reinforced by the 90s and then reinforced in a different way by 9-11 and the, uh, the so-called global war on terror. Uh, so there was an unending uh, pattern of uh, righteous war uh, to fight. And, uh, and I think the moral dimension is very important for Americans. And I think that's one reason that uh, Biden and company are so resistant to diplomacy is that they're mired in this rigid morass of, of moralism. Uh, and they can't look beyond their noses to see that, you know, you, you have to find common ground with people whose actions you might deplore. And that's called diplomacy. And diplomacy is at odds with the notion of the righteous community. Uh, and I think it's the maintaining of that righteous community that is sort of the last act of, of empire here that we will see. Uh, uh, unfolding before us uh, in in the uh, months and and uh, and years to come. You know, I could end it there, and it's a strong statement, and and, and I, I agree with much of it. Except, it takes responsibility away from people who are not born again Christians and who are not don't believe in a righteous community. I don't know what they believe in. Some go to church, some Sure, don't. sure. Well, what I'm saying is it's secular, though. It's not... It's, yeah, it's I, not, I understand it's not that. But the inspiration again. is actually a perversion, an ideological perversion of something that uh, I certainly believe in, I assume, assume you do, a notion of democracy, of limited government, of responsibility, sure. of elections and so forth. And, and these are the same people who have destroyed the meaning of all those democratic institutions, not by talking about an afterlife, but by deliberate 
uh, embrace of a public relations distortion, money counts, and I'm not just talking about, you know, Citizens United. I mean, the, the, the mangling of language. Uh, what, what Huxley and Orwell both warned about when they predicted a dystopia, which seems to come upon us, that, that their careerism, and this is our colleagues, why yeah. we're not having discussion on college campuses right, uh, right now is not the, the hangover of fundamentalist uh, religion. No, no, I don't. I didn't. I, I wouldn't say that either. I, I, I completely agree that it's that it's it's a, a kind of secular hubris. Uh, it's techn- technologically based, uh, and it and it's and it's based on a very limited and distorted idea of democracy because. The whole the whole notion of democracy now has pretty much boiled down to voting, voting and elections, and and uh, nobody talks about the importance of spirited and and uh, robust public debate and free speech. You know, to get back to those, you know, the so-called this is an Orwellian phrase, right? Content moderation on social media, content moderation. Oh, you're against the war in in, in uh, sorry, it's Freudian slip. You're against the war in Ukraine. Um, well, we have to moderate that. We have to moderate your content. We can't have uh, that vi- that violation of community norms. There are all these phrases. I mean, Orwell should certainly be living at this hour. I agree. Uh, the blandness and, and the uh, euphemism that uh, the ultimate triumph of euphemism was the renaming of the War Department the defen- as the Defense Department in, in 1947. And we've just lived through one euphemism after another. I don't know how to explain all this except to say that people somehow combine this secular hubris with a, a kind of moral certainty and a longing for moral certainty uh, that is very dangerous. And uh, I don't think. Okay, let me. T- this, I'm, I'm running out of juice myself here. I know. So, uh, I know you are. Yeah. Let me just end this. Well, I don't want. I yeah. can't have the last word, but but I do. I because I and I I love the way you explain. Things and I agree and so forth. I think it's presumptuous for me to lecture you in any way, but I, I have come away. I've interviewed a lot of these people. I've interviewed a lot of policy people maker. who other people think of as monsters. You know, I actually have a letter from Richard Nixon. Uh, I, I try to summarize his career and went to see him. He invited me to come see him because at least I could cut him a little slack and see, well, it wasn't so simple. We always have this ordering. Now, Trump washing gets them all off the hook. This whole election is going to be fought by, oh, you can't have a third party or Cornell West or RFK. You can't do this. We have to get the Biden in because otherwise it's Trump and he's yeah, 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 sure. and so forth. And I see it in much more in cynical terms. I see it as driven by careerism, privilege, uh, and uh, playing with language. Uh, you know, too good to check. I remember a former editor of mine, uh, explain what some of the corruption at the LA Times. And I said, well, why didn't they look into this? And how come? And he said, too good to check, you know, sure, uh, sure. too good to check. And, well, this and is, yeah, this is where the whole notion of meritocracy comes in. These people believe they're the product of a meritocracy. They have the credentials to prove it. And, uh, and I right. think that, lead, that leads to a kind of overweening arrogance. And uh, what's happening now is their arguments are not strong. No, it's crazy. We had we were all supposed to be preoccupied with climate change, and now we're talking about more fighting and more tanks and more guns. We obviously right. forget. No, no one is going to address climate yeah. change. Under so these what I'm saying is, and let me use this show as a test case, because I've seen the internet change just in the years that now I've been editing and publishing right. and doing stuff on the internet. Uh, you can't get. They have denied any kind of large audience to people who challenge the dominant narrative in a coherent right. way. Right, right. If you, you know, show cats sure, sure. debating it or something, uh, uh, you know, you can get away with stunned, but, but you, you will not, I just published Cy Hirsch, uh, you know, and, and very thoughtful and so forth. Didn't get that large audience. I don't think it's because Cy Hirsch lost his ability I think the internet is being censored very heavily, Absolutely. and I don't think I'm being paranoid about it. No, I completely it. agree, and I think that the, the the articles in the Times and the Post this morning were perfectly suggestive of how <clears throat> the ruling elite uh, in Washington has has decided that 
you know, this is a terrible thing. This this inform- the source of disinformation is 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 Trump and the and the Yahoos who support him. It has nothing to do with the CIA. It has nothing to do with the threat to free speech. It's all uh, anti-science. It's all bad information that's dangerous and has to be suppressed. And so the, the view of this this uh, government and you know suppression of speech on social media is is the, it's setting back the war on disinformation. That's what the Times and the Post are saying. This is a setback to what we've been trying to do. You know to to get the truth out, and uh, it's it's a very it that's again an Orwellian moment for me, where uh, right. where the, the actual people who are suppressing uh, information are claiming to be uh, right. And to finally wrap this speech. up, bringing it yeah. back to your own, you know, they always say people in the military when you go to a ball game or something, they're there to protect our freedom. Well, you were right. there to protect our freedom. Right. You were there. Maybe you could have pushed the button uh, on instructions and destroyed the world, and you would have been doing your duty. Thank you for your service. Yeah, right. Almost got us all killed. Uh, thank you for your service. But to question it, when you question it, or say somebody like Ron Kovic, who gave up three quarters of his body right. in the right. war in Vietnam, question it, then suddenly your patriotism is challenged, right. uh, denied. And, right. and, and I, I think what makes this so frightening right now is that we have the illusion that we are engaged in a public forum right now, you and I talking, because we have the internet, we have all the things. Right. The fact of the matter is, as Chris Hedges points out, the walls are, are, are closing in. Right. And, and the debate is, we have never had such a narrow, tightly controlled debate as about Ukraine. Well, let me, war. I mean, uh, Rick MacArthur is one of the few people, the, the publisher of Harper's Magazine, uh, is one of the few people with a something of a, close to a mass circulation magazine anyway, uh, who's trying to do something about it, specifically about the Ukraine, the absence of debate in Ukraine. So I recommend the, the article, Why Are We in Ukraine? from the June issue to anyone who's interested. It's about powerful uh, recreation of that narrative that you and I were both referring to that one has to know about in order to know that Putin dis- didn't wake up one morning and decide to uh, to invade Ukraine because he's an evil uh, neo-imperialist. Uh, he did it because he was provoked over years. And this is, uh, I, I'm not quite sure where to end either, but I am very much afraid my computer is about to die. Yeah, okay. Off. So, I want to thank you, and I want to thank you. For, what is the book coming out? We can at least sell some books here. Animal Spirits, okay. The American Pursuit of Vitality from Camp Meeting to Wall Street. And there's there's a lot about the war and empire in there eventually, but there's also a lot about capitalism, which, of course, is tangled up in war and empire. So, uh, But I, I think that... Uh, your your listeners might enjoy it, so I recommend it. Okay, as the author, and thank you for doing this. I also want to thank Laura Condejarian and Christopher Ho at uh, KCRW, the NPR, uh, the uh, station in uh, Santa Monica, California, and hopefully they'll keep posting this. This will be one of those test cases for the rest of the NPR station. I want, to, but no, they've been very good at getting this up. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Joshua Shear, our executive producer, uh, for bringing your article to my attention. Uh, Diego uh, Ramos for writing the introduction. Max Jones uh, for doing the video aspect as he did today. And I particularly want to thank the JKW Foundation in the memory of a terrific independent public intellectual thinker, uh, <coughs> Gene Stein, uh, for providing some funding to help these shows get produced. And so see you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence. And thank you, Jackson, Professor Jackson Lears of Rutgers University.